proceed. And I'll start off by, first of all, thanking Dan and, and everybody. I'm not sure how many people we have here tonight, but it looks like a pretty good crowd. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about what has become my, my favorite ham radio topic. Uh, just ask anyone. And, uh, but this, and, and this is a talk that I've given to many and kind of developed over the years and given to many, many ham radio clubs. But this is going to be different. This is actually the first time I've done it virtually. And uh, the, since I see you all being muted, I'm not going to be able to tell if, I'm, if my jokes are going over. So uh, we'll find out. We'll find out uh, afterwards, I guess. So uh, this is great. Um, I, 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 I know this is a group that's particularly interested in public service, and I certainly am too. Uh, the, the main theme is not public service. There are many, many ways that DFing can be used for public service, and I'll even touch on that toward the end. But basically, the idea is it's fun, and the more people that know how to do it, uh, then the better off ham radio is, because when the time comes that it's needed, why, uh, there'll be that many more people that are capable of doing it. But more than that, it's just a lot of fun. And uh, I wouldn't have kept doing it for as, this many years if it didn't have a great fun component to it. So uh, that's kind of, I'm going to be selling the sizzle and not the steak primarily here. I'll just be talking about how much fun you can have doing direction finding, but I'll also talk about the simple ways. It's not that difficult to do. Uh, it's certainly not like building a major contest station or something like that. It's something you can do without a great deal of uh, uh, time and money to, uh, to get involved in it. But of course, it's, it's one of those things that you can't do by yourself. You need you need friends, you need other people, and uh, you need somebody to hide transmitters for you, that sort of thing. So it makes a great club activity, and I'm finding more and more clubs, and particularly even as we're coming out of COVID, I'm finding several groups are reinstituting and getting involved again in transmitter hunting as a way of building back their clubs, and I think this is just really terrific. So I'm hoping that uh, some of you might see that idea, and if it's not going on in your area, maybe you'll want to uh, to do a little bit of it. So that's that's the primary thing. We'll be talking about it for the whole family. Uh, and when I push my button, nothing's happening. This is not a uh, one of need. Uh, let's see. There we go. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to advance slides, but apparently I now can. Um, there are two major types of of hidden transmitter hunting that I can talk about, and I will talk about, and I've basically experienced them both. And in, in, in sort of doing that, I'll give a little bit of history. And in my own situation, I went on my first hidden transmitter hunt. I think I was 14 years old. And my dad had to drive, of course. It was a mobile hunt. And I had a, uh, uh, a Halicrafters SX100. This was a 75 meter hunt that the club put on our club in our little town of 12,000 people. And uh, I had a Halicrafters SX100. It's the same thing, one that's behind my left shoulder here uh, on the front seat of our convertible and uh, powered by a vi vibrator power supply that I put together. And, uh, and the antenna was the back of an old L American 5 radio that I had tuned up to 80 meters, and that was the loop antenna that I used to try to find the transmitter. So that was kind of how I got started and realized it was a lot of fun, but I also realized there were a lot of things I had to learn. But I kind of got away from it and away from ham radio through the college years, and uh, we came out to California and began to get interested in maybe getting into ham radio again. There was a fellow from the Fullerton Radio Club that used to call me every month and say, why don't you come to our meetings? I wonder how many clubs have that anymore, but this fellow was insistent. I mean, he, he really said, we're doing a lot of really neat things and you ought to come and, and experience it. So I did. And one of the things that I learned is that the club was doing hit, mobile hidden transmitter hunting every month. And uh, uh, the best part of it was that this was about the time that uh, my wife, April, WA6OPS, was getting involved in ham radio. She got her license that year, 1976. And she said to me, you know, that sounds like something we could do together. Wow, what an opportunity. So uh, didn't look back. Uh, and we started going on mobile transmitter hunts, did that for many, many years, and uh, still like to do it when we get the opportunity. Um, and then around 1991, I began, and, and I knew about this all along, but it really had never 
been experienced much in the USA. I was hearing more about the way they're doing transmitter hunting, or they were doing it and still are, in Europe and in some other parts of the world where it's all on foot, it's done in big parks, and, uh, and it's an international sport. The teams from various countries get together and, uh, and have events. And uh, it had never been done pretty much in the Western Hemisphere, but there were some Russian uh, enthusiasts who came to Portland, Oregon for a sister city event, and uh, they put on a transmitter hunt. And April and I traveled up to Portland to see what this was about. And uh, what a great idea, and we need to do more of this. And we brought it back, and uh, in the next few years, we had a couple of events at uh, uh, some of the uh, Southwest Division conventions. We had one at the West Coast VHF conference in 1996. And uh, by 1998, there were some people that said, we want to go to the World Championships, which were being held in Hungary that year. And uh, we actually did field a small team. I was not on it, but I was very involved in trying to help people uh, or make the arrangements and go to it. And they went, they had fun, they came back, they said, we got to do more of this. And it wasn't long before we had the first national championships that occurred in 2001 in Albuquerque, and we've gone very, uh, go on, gone uh, on and on since then. So I'm probably doing more of that now than mobile transmitter hunting, but I like it because it's a great thing for, for youth, and, uh, and, and I'll tell you more about that as we get further into it. So that's a brief introduction, and, but let's start off talking about mobile tea hunting. And uh, normally when I talk to a, a club, I will say, uh, how many of you have gone on a hidden transmitter hunt? And I usually get a, you know, a, a smattering of hands. Uh, and I said, well, how many of you have tried to find a source of noise or interference? I get a few more hands. And uh, so that's how I kind of gauge what the group is, uh, the level of the group. Um, can't do that tonight, but that's okay. I know, you're, I know some of you have done it, and, uh, and I, I'm hoping that the rest of you would like to experience it. This is the start of a, well, actually two photos here. Uh, the, start, the, the big one is the start of a mobile transmitter hunt in, uh, in Fullerton. And this is uh, the, the hilltop where it was done for many, many years and is still done once in a while. Uh, now there's million dollar homes there. That's one of the problems. Many of the hilltops that we used to use for starting points are, uh, uh, the neighbors now don't like all those cars lined up in front but we get along. The uh, smaller picture is a start of a transmitter hunt in Albuquerque, where they started at the University of New Mexico. But the point of it is that you see, before the hunt starts, a lot of people with strange looking antennas on their vehicle, but they're all friends, except they're getting ready to compete with one another. And, uh, and the neat thing about it is that the, you never, when you start out on a hidden transmitter hunt, you never know where you're gonna end up and you never know what you're going to find. And uh, that gets proven over and over, and maybe that's the thing I like the most about it, or at least about mobile transmitter hunting. Uh, for example, uh, well, here's a couple of examples. On the left is uh, a rather big antenna, which was uh, an antenna that people had to find on one of our Southern California six meter transmitter hunts that we still hold. Uh, twice a year. They're now mostly out in the Inland Empire. And, they're, and those of you that might know Will, AA6DD, he is the kind of the proprietor of the six meter transmitter hunts. And they're a lot of fun. So uh, that's, that's kind of big. And when you get there, you know, you found the hidden transmitter and you say, okay, I found it. But it isn't always that simple. For example, on the right, and again, these, these some of these photos go back quite a few years because April and I have been doing it for quite a few years. Uh, but this was from a hunt at uh, the AWRL Southwest Division Convention in Ventura, California, put on by uh, Daryl, uh, KF6DI. And uh, the, you will, everyone started from the, you know, it was, it was to be on the grounds of the convention near the hotel. Everybody's hearing the transmitter and they're going around and they just don't see it. And finally, somebody said, you know, it's really strong over here by this payphone. Yeah, this will tell you how long ago that was. Uh, anyway, uh, sure enough, uh, they, they just 
couldn't figure out where it was until somebody pulled out the Ventura County phone book and inside hollowed out phone book was an HT and a battery and that was the hidden transmitter. Now that gives you an idea how, uh, how some of these hints can go. And you know, we can't do things like we used to. No phone books, no pay phones. Uh, and, and one of the hunts that I've heard of, I wasn't a part of it, but another thing that you can't do anymore was the guys that hid, and this was back in the days when the transmitters had tubes in them. Uh, they hid a transmitter under, the, under a chair in a departure lounge at LAX airport. Now, <laughs> imagine you can't really do that anymore. Uh, so, you know, we, we, security and other things have kind of prevented some of the things that we used to do. But there's other ways we can have fun, and people are always coming up with new and clever ideas for hidden transmitter hunts. For example, this one. Uh, I don't think you're going to recognize this bag lady. Uh, this was on a night hunt, in, uh, well, started from Fullerton, ended up in Santa Ana, and this was about the time that the main place mall had just opened up down in Santa Ana, and uh, everybody's kind of driving around the parking lot of the main place mall and saying, you know, the signal's kind of strong over here, but it, I'm not sure, you know, but it wasn't a minute ago, and, and now it's stronger over here, and we couldn't, they couldn't kind of figure out what was going on until they looked at, and, and eventually somebody thought that the signal was very strong coming from this bag lady. And uh, somebody finally got up the nerve to go up to the bag lady and uh, ask her a few questions. The bag lady, of course, turned out to be Christy, K-0-I-U, who was April's sister and uh, was uh, part of the hiding team for that hunt. April and I did not know she was going to do this. So we had fun just like everyone else there. But again, you, you never know where you're gonna end up and you never know what you're going to find. This is one of my favorites. And sadly, it was a hunt I wasn't on, but it would have been fun to be on. Uh, it occurred, uh, it was one of the San Gabriel Valley hunts on a Sunday afternoon, I believe, a very sunny Sunday afternoon. And everybody quickly found this park, this small park, and it's a pretty manicured park, so there's not there many places to hide a transmitter. So, they, so they're wandering around this park, and the signal always kept coming from this young lady who was sitting on a blanket reading a book. Her name, by the way, was Tanya. So they went up. Uh, so finally, after a lot of walking around, saying, no, nah, it couldn't be that, couldn't be that, couldn't be that. They, Don, KF6GQ on the right here, finally had the nerve to walk up to Tanya and say, would you, you know, introduced himself, found out what her name was, and said, would you mind getting up so we can check under your blanket? And she obliged them and stood up, moved to the side, and they looked under the blanket, and there's nothing there. But then they turned their antennas, and it seemed to be coming from Tanya. And as it turned out, make a long story short, uh, the, the transmitter was in the top of Tanya's bikini with the antenna in the bikini strap. Honestly, this did happen. So again, you never know where you're gonna end up. You never know what you're gonna find and you never know what, you know, the more clever people we have hiding, the more fun it's going to be for everybody. Now, and again, this is an old picture. How many, how many of us still use protractors and paper maps? Well, some of us still do actually, but we have better technology and I'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of people say, well, Joe, what's so hard about this transmitter hunting stuff? The antenna points to the, you know, points to the transmitter. All you have to do is you get in your car, you take a bearing, you drive a little bit, signal gets stronger, maybe make a course correction or two, keep driving. Pretty soon you're gonna get there and uh, everybody goes to the restaurant and has fun. Well, it's not that, it, it can be that simple, rarely, but uh, usually there's, there's several, many tricks actually that hiders can use to uh, make things more interesting and give you a tough time. And I've kind of codified them down to uh, maybe four specific things. And the first, of, first one is signal parameters. Uh, transmissions, transmission duration can make a big difference. I have known of some hunts where the transmission is like, every five minutes 
Well, that's one way to make a uh, simple hunt harder, that's for sure, or, and more difficult. If you only hear the signal every five minutes, pretty good chance you're going to bypass it if you're not careful. Uh, here in Southern California, that was never something we did. It was generally speaking, uh, if the transmission wasn't continuous, it was on you know, at least every minute or so, so that uh, you got a chance to get a bearing. So that's one way to make it challenging. Another is to vary the power. If you're using a uh, directional antenna and an S-meter to get your bearings, imagine what happens when the power is changing and suddenly the transmitter is uh, 50 watts and the next transmission it's five watts. Uh, that might make it a little bit more challenging and that is generally not allowed by the rules of some of the hunts, but some of the hunts, they say no rules at all. So you never know. Uh, that's one thing you need to know, of course, when you go on a hunt is know the rules of the hunt so you know kind of what they might be doing. Modulation characteristics. Um, I have heard of people that transmitted white noise. Uh, imagine trying to get a bearing when all you're hearing is white noise when there's no signal and white noise when there is signal. So uh, that's, that's, again, probably not allowed by most of the hunts, but again, that's one of the ways to make it difficult. Next thing we'll talk about is inaccessibility. Now in Southern California, we got a lot of roads, we got a lot of strange places people can hide. It's true, I, bet, I guess, pretty much everywhere. Again, when you start out uh, and, and you, you know, the, the hider found, the, found, the found a place to hide the transmitter, and he probably didn't go through a heck of a lot of trouble to uh, find that place or uh, didn't find the roads very difficult, but he's hoping when he turns on his signal that that will be the case for you and that before the hunt is over, you're going to end up in a situation like this. Now, how would you like to, uh, now normally roads like that, you know, I mean, a hider would not hide on a road like that, but he's hoping that you might have to take a road like that, or you might end up on it accidentally in a situation like that before you get there. And uh, uh, there are some hunts where they use APRS, uh, they ask the hiders, the San Diego folk guys like to do this, guys and gals, they will uh, ask you to transmit your location by APRS so the hunters can kind of watch and see where you are, whether you're getting close, whether you're taking strange routes like this, that sort of thing. And that makes it a lot, much, a lot of fun for the hiders. Now, indirect signal paths. Imagine, uh, particularly on two meters, but we actually have hunts on 440, and that's even, it's even more so there. The, um, the uh, effect that terrain features can have on the signal. Uh, here we have uh, uh, one of the mountains of Southern California. And it turns out that when there's snow on the mountains, this effect is much, much more pronounced. That uh, signals can be deliberately reflected off mountains to uh, cause the hunters to uh, work a lot harder. Here's an example. Uh, you can see the orange, uh, well, I won't call it a circle, but the boundaries of the hunt are in orange on this map. And um, you start, uh, and the hunt start is at the end of the arrow. I don't know if you can see the cursor there, but it's, it's right there in Fullerton. That's where the start of the hunt is. And uh, let's say the hider uh, takes advantage of Mount Baldy or uh, one of the other mountains, Mount San Antonio, one of the other mountains, and he hides over here by Rose Hill Cemetery and uh, points his beam toward Mount Baldy. So the signal goes to Mount Baldy, bounces back to Fullerton, and where is the bearing that the hunters are going to get? They're not going to get a bearing over here toward Rose Hills. It not only is it off the edge of the beam, but there's all the hills in the way between uh, Fullerton and that location. But the direct, uh, the best way for the signal to propagate is to bounce off uh, the, the northern mountain. So the bearing that the hunters get is northeast and right up the 57 freeway through the canyon. And that's the way that they'll tend to go is they'll go right up that freeway to the canyon. If they get to the boundary and realize it, they may stop. If they don't, they may keep going. And even if they even, it turns out that even at the boundary, the strongest signal is going to be coming from the mountains. So uh, there are situations where people have done that and the hunters will drive, well, what they'll do is generally drive the boundaries. And if they drive the wrong way, they're gonna drive 
90 miles to get to a transmitter that's 20 miles away. Hiders love that. Uh, I think they have, some of them have a real sadistic streak, but it's all in good fun. And the nice thing about this is uh, you can't just do it once and uh, say, and everybody says, oh, I know what that trick is because it works the other way too. Uh, the hider can hide on here by Prado Dam in the clear. And again, the signal does not directly get through the Chino Hills very well, particularly if it's off the side of the beam and he puts it kind of down on the edge of a hill and it's blocked by the terrain. And you can get, you can get the same effect, that same bearing up the 57 freeway by uh, a transmitter that's located on the other side at Prado Dam. So the hunters say, get to the end and they say, well, which way is he? And uh, if you drive the wrong way, they can again put 90 miles on to get to a transmitter that's 20 miles away. Other strange effects can happen when you're hunting. And sometimes you can take advantage of them and sometimes they hurt you. Here's a hunt, again, starting in Fullerton. Uh, and uh, this, the bearing basically was off to the northeast, but it wasn't consistent. It would be there, you know, it would be almost non-existent very, very low for a while. And then it would kind of get very strong for about five, maybe three, four minutes, and then go down into the noise again. Well, think what might cause a signal to do that. And that's kind of the key to the hunt, if you can figure out what that is. Well, it turns out, airplane bounce. The, the air, aircraft coming in to the Southern California airports pass through that area, generally speaking, and uh, the transmitter, which was down here by Murrieta, uh, is propagating primarily, uh, yeah, some mountain propagation, but primarily uh, the aircraft are reflecting that signal back to the starting point. So again, you never know where you're gonna end up. You never gonna what, know what you're gonna find. If you get out into the middle of nowhere and you see a, 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 an antenna kind of sticking up in the middle of nowhere with a coax on it, uh, you found the hidden transmitter, right? Well, maybe and maybe not, uh, because occasionally some uh, hider will put out a decoy. But uh, generally speaking, that's true. But sometimes you get out in the middle of nowhere, and this is all you see. And uh, now where's the transmitter? Well, that's why you have hopefully good equipment, and you kind of figure it out uh, as you go along. If, you, if you've uh, read my transmitter hunting book, you've actually seen this photograph of a hunt that Walt WA6SGA put on some years ago, where uh, the hunters got to a kind of a, a park or a strip park, and they're going up and down trying to find the transmitter and, and really do, not figuring out where it is until somebody looked very closely at this sprinkler pipe, uh, which was sticking up out of a pile of debris and realized that this sprinkler pipe was 19 inches long, that it had an insulator at the bottom, and underneath were some radials. But I got to tell you, Walt was very clever because he had that hooked to a small bottle, and that sprinkler had dripped water. So again, you never know what, uh, <laughs> what you're going to find. He, uh, especially when there were numerous other sprinklers in that same area, uh, they could have been any one of them. So again, you need good equipment, and eventually, uh, if you do it right, you'll find the hidden transmitter. Here's a, an antenna that was put together by a ham in San Diego. It's actually a dipole that was hanging from a tree, and you can see that it was covered with leaves, and he hung it up in a tree. So at night, you shine your light up there, and how would you know that there was an antenna up there? So again, camouflage and other clever ideas. Uh, small, you know, <laughs> Back, as I said, when, when, we, when it was tubes, it was not nearly as easy. And as it got, radios got smaller and smaller, it um, got easier and easier to hide transmitters, at least low power ones. Here's a transmitter that's about the size of a postage stamp that uh, uh, actually now they're available from several sources. But there's very interesting things that you can do with them. For example, uh, Tom Curley and I, uh, set this up for a transmitter hunt. This was actually a second transmitter because it was on a hunt because it was set low power, but it was in the vicinity of the first transmitter. Uh, 
I was looking for a place to hide and I found this pile of old, very weather beaten, small two by four segments. So I took one of them and I gave it to Tom and he's, uh, cause he has a nice wood shop and he sliced it open like a bagel. And we put the hidden transmitter inside the two by four. And, uh, and then of course, threw it back in the pile of two by fours. And again, the hiders had to figure out where it was. And uh, it w we had great fun watching them do that. We called it the stud T. How do you find these hidden transmitters? Again, it doesn't take a, a major setup. Generally speaking, here in Southern California, having some gain in your antenna when you're hiding, because people hide in very low power transmitters, they hide them miles away, and you've got to be able to hear the signal at the starting point, which hopefully is a high point. Uh, actually, from this picture, this was taken at Montgomery Field in San Diego, which is not a particularly high point, but it's a clear spot. And it, it was taken at the start of a hunt of several of the vehicles here. And you have this one, and this fella really got it up in the air. I'm a little worried that, uh, I, I have a feeling that he did not drive with it quite that high, because that's a little bit uh, like, like you might hit something. But I think he raised it up to get the starting bearing. And you notice he has vertical polarization. Over here, we had a, a fellow hunting, or at least trying to listen for the signal with horizontal polarization. And here's a fellow that split it in the middle. One of the things that's very important if you're hunting two meters, which is the most popular band for transmitter hunting right now, nowadays anyway, is that you hunt the same polarization as the signal. If you can figure out if the hider is transmitting horizontal or vertical, because most of the hunt rules allow him or her to do either or a combination, or uh, we had a one hider that uh, used a, uh, built a helix antenna and transmitted circular polarization. And that did some really interesting things on the bounces too. But if the best thing is to try to figure out what he's using and use the same polarization. So if you make an antenna for uh, two meters, make sure you can do something to get uh, your choice of polarization and try to figure out the right way. And you may need to make a mid-course correction. If you pick the wrong polarization, what's going to happen? The reflections from all the hills and mountains are going to be much stronger relative to the direct signal, which is going to be suppressed by being cross-polarized. So clearly you want to pick the right polarization. Yagis were popular and still are. Cubicle quads are maybe even more popular. Uh, some say you can get them down closer to the vehicle with less interaction. That's probably true. Uh, this uh, was the setup of Kubi and 6 jsx when he was hunting here in Southern California. Uh, the, this antenna is uh, strung wire. In other words, there's some, uh, a wooden boom, uh, some fiberglass spreaders, and thin wire making the elements. Uh, one thing I would note is this is a very compact antenna, and when you can make a four element antenna with this short a boom, you basically end up with the same performance as a three element antenna. You probably you want to have a longer boom if you want more gain, but uh, Kubi was going for, uh, uh, I guess, low wind resistance. That's certainly true of these quads. The biggest, the biggest problem with an antenna like this is the low hanging quad eating willow. And you have to be very careful that uh, when you go under trees, because you may very well snag and break your antenna. You'll notice here in the upper right, uh, the slip joint for selecting polarization. And the lower right is my favorite kind of, of antenna uh, is the stiff wire quad, because it is much more forgiving if you run it under a tree and mash it up, uh, just bend it back into shape and you're back on the hunt. And, you know, whatever vehicle you have, I have seen cheap and dirty mounts of all sorts of strange things over the years, ways that guys have, and gals have lashed their antennas to the vehicle. Here's something that was made out of, guess, I guess it was aluminum vent pipe material and basically captured inside the door frame. Uh, again, somebody did the same thing over here on the upper right with wire. Down at the bottom, you need something to be sort of a thrust bearing. And I've seen this sort of thing. And, and down on the lower right, uh, you see somebody that took advantage of the, uh, uh, of the uh, armrest and did it that way. And then there's the pointer, which could be made out of a uh, vice grips. 
So again, you see it, you see it all. And some people, of course, are much more uh, uh, savvy than that and make more pretty installations. Here's an example of uh, something kind of a PVC nightmare uh, in the main picture here that this gentleman made. Uh, it holds the antenna right in the center of the vehicle, which is a good place for it. And he's got uh, levers such that either the driver or the passenger could turn the antenna uh, through this linkage system. Pretty clever, and again, that's the sort of thing that you will see ham ingenuity at its finest because there's no one system that everybody uses. Everybody uses something a little different. This is how April and I got started with the antenna out the right side, uh, out the passenger window, and uh, using the four element stiff wire quad. Why the passenger side window? A number of people say, well, why not put it on the driver's side? In the if in the, in the state of California, I don't know how it is in other states, but the state of California, you are not allowed on the driver's side to have anything protrude beyond the line of the fenders. And so putting this antenna on the driver's side could get you a ticket. So the passenger gets to turn it and because you're allowed one foot of overhang on the passenger side. And uh, so April loved turning an antenna. She did a great job. Although I have to admit, more than once I'd reach across and try to grab it myself. But uh, we got along fairly well and had a lot of fun with that. But when we got our van, which is the red van in this picture in 1986, that was, that was genteel. And every, uh, if you look closely, every vehicle in this picture, uh, the, the hiders have basically drilled a hole through the roof to put that antenna right in the center of the vehicle. And the reason for putting it in the center is you can have a nice long antenna without any overhang at all. And it's also nice because the front side, the driver can turn the antenna, the front side, uh, the front seat passenger can turn the antenna. Even the person in the back seat can turn the antenna if the need arises, if you mount it in the right place. So that's what all these people have done. And uh, Tom and I, Basically, I, we had the van three days, and I took it over to Tom's house because he had a wonderful hole saw, and we put that antenna. Let me uh, show it here. The uh, uh, we put the we used uh, some PVC fittings, ran it through the roof console, and it was uh, a really nice setup for many many years. Uh, yes, that is a plumber's helper. Yes, it deflects the rain in in, uh, in case it rains during the hunt. Um, here's a, another how another ham did it. Uh, he used a marine fuel fitting to keep the rain out when he wasn't hunting. I don't think he uh, figured out that the reason that there's a hole inside PVC pipe is for coax to go through. And I worry sometimes when he's not hunting about the attentiveness of uh, gas station attendants. But other than that, it works out fairly well. Down at the bottom, we have uh, a way of, of uh, uh, showing the direction it's pointing with a pointer and a compass rose. And another very important thing that you will need when you're mobile hunting is the attenuator, uh, something to knock down the signal. Because pretty soon as you start approaching, your S meter is going to pin. You need something to uh, attenuate the signal. And for mobile hunting, a uh, resistive attenuator uh, works great. This is one that uh, is you can build, but uh, there's, there's lots of other attenuators in the market you can, uh, you can use. Now, I got rid of the van three years ago. I mean, it was 32 years old, so it was time to go. And uh, I love that old van because I could drill holes anywhere in that van and not, be, not come up with a problem. I drilled them in the floor. I drilled them in the sides. I drilled them in the top. Not true of new cars. Those car, cars have airbags everywhere and lots of other wiring and other things like that. And I was afraid to drill too, too many holes in it. So I got a vehicle with a sunroof. And this is a mount I made to uh, put the antenna through the sunroof, which is fine except in a driving rain. But the other thing I did is I used bearings because it may, at high speeds, you need a way to make that antenna easy to turn. The bearings do help that. So here's some hints if you decide to go mobile tea hunting is use some bearings to, uh, to help make your antenna easy to turn. Now, some of you are saying, my gosh, this is 2021. We, uh, it, I, isn't there something more high tech than just a, a beam or a quad on the car? And yes, there, there certainly are other things. Uh, 
if you made a list of the things that you'd really like to have uh, in, a, in, a, in an ideal setup, you'd like uh, something that w the antenna, uh, it, it, you don't have to turn the antenna manually. Uh, you'd like it to take 100 bearings every second. You would like it so that it doesn't matter what power the hunter idr is running as long as you can hear the signal. You'd like it to hold the bearing. Uh, and you'd like to be, and, and a few of these other things, and you'd like to be able to put it on a rental car. Well, there is such a thing, and some of you have probably guessed what that something is, and that is the Doppler set. And you may have seen them advertised. Here, every, every, every Doppler set in this picture has something in common. And that's something is you can't buy them anymore. Uh, not new anyway. Uh, these sets have all come and gone over the years. I've seen Dopplers starting in the late 1970s after the QST article come and go and everybody got the business. And some people uh, kind of took advantage of that. And that's a long story that I won't go into now. But none of these you can buy before, but you can today buy a kit from uh, uh, Bob Simmons up in Santa Barbara of boards that will make you a fairly nice uh, Doppler set with either this small ring of antennas or this big ring and a three-digit display. Uh, he sold a lot of kits over the years. Uh, a lot of hams don't want to just get a set of bare boards though. They want something a little bit more uh, uh, plug and play. So uh, Bob licensed his design to uh, Global TS TSCM Group, which is a basically a Chinese outfit, but in the USA. But the, they, are, they are making a hardware version of the, of the uh, Pico Dop, and they're selling it. And you've probably seen it advertised even on the ARRL website. Uh, and a lot of people it had a lot of problems at the beginning. They have a kind of a new version. It's much, much better. And you will see this set being used on tea hunts uh, around the country. And a lot of, uh, there are a lot of places where Dopplers are the norm and you don't see beams very much. In fact, they, uh, and, but everybody says, oh, he's got a Doppler. He's going to win the hunt. Not necessarily true because uh, the Doppler technology has some, some issues if you're thinking about how you're going to start hunting. First of all, you need a stronger signal because the antenna doesn't have any significant gain. Uh, I have often hunted with both a quad and a Doppler on the, on the big van roof, and I will be three quarters of the way to the hidden transmitter before the Doppler starts giving me a re usable reading. So you've, uh, there's a definite dif difference in gain. The accuracy of a Doppler, it, well, just because it's got three digits on the display doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate down to a degree. Typically, the best accuracy you can hope for is about plus or minus five degrees. Uh, that is at quite adequate when you're getting close. It may not be adequate when you're miles and miles away. Uh, if the signal is vertical, of course, it's the same polarization as your Doppler antennas. If the signal is horizontally polarized, you have the same problem as you would with a horizontally polarized uh, beam trying to hunt a vertically polarized signal. There are going to be problems with reflections. Uh, the Doppler only gives you one indication, one direction. Well, what if you're getting direct signal and reflected signal? And you can usually tease that out with a beam and say, oh, I think this is direct and I think this is reflected. The Doppler won't do that for you. It's only going to combine it and give one probably incorrect direction. So there's a number of, of, uh, of other things that uh, uh, are disadvantages. But again, uh, it's the right tool for the job. Certainly, if you're hunting, for example, someone who is a jammer on your repeater and he's mobile and he's running a considerable amount of power as he's driving down the freeway, the Doppler is the way to go to try to find that person. It's a little harder to do with a beam or a quad. Now, the other thing about Dopplers is that uh, the newer, uh, certainly uh, the one I was talking about and some others have a serial output that can be fed into a computer to give 
put bearings automatically on a map. This is a much, <laughs> this is an ideal setup. Here we show, and some people say, let's have three people in three locations give a bearing and we're gonna know exactly where it is. So I've got station one, station two, station three, all taking bearings and they are point, they're crossing right there at this one point. Well, is that where the hidden transmitter is? Might be, you're certainly gonna have to go close and find out because again, I said, maybe plus or minus five degree accuracy. So let's superimpose the plus or minus five degree accuracy over, the, uh, over these bearings. And you see that you have a rather wide area, relatively speaking, where that hidden transmitter could be. So, or jammer or whatever you're hunting. So uh, you certainly got to get close and that's why uh, being able to hunt mobile uh, and not rely just on base stations is the way to go when you're transmitter hunting. Now, I told you about paper maps. There, are, there is Google Hunt, which I just showed you, which works on a PC, but there's also a, uh, a, uh, an app. There's actually more than one app, but this is the one that has become probably the most popular. It's called SigTrax, and it was uh, uh, developed by a fellow down in uh, Alabama. And it, uh, it works with, well, this, this shows it on an iPad. And, uh, it will, and uh, he has developed an interface that uses Bluetooth to get the signal from your Doppler into the iPad. And uh, it will basically plot bearings as you go along. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about that, I won't talk much more about it tonight, but uh, you can read about it on my website, which I haven't talked about yet, but uh, it's homingin.com. And uh, there's an article there about uh, sync tracks and some of the other apps that you can use for direction finding. COVID kind of shut down transmitter hunting in uh, mobile transmitter hunting even in Southern California. For a while, uh, some people interpreted the California regulations as you can't even go out in your car for a drive and meet other people. Uh, and this was true elsewhere in the country. So a number of hunters did something that they had been doing before, but started doing a lot more. And that is unattended fox boxes. And they would, uh, the uh, hiders would take ammo cans with a transmitter in them and put them in unlikely places, chain them to, to something, to a tree or something like that, and say, transmitters on the air on such and such a frequency, go find it. Now to keep the batteries from running down quickly, the way that they normally do this is there's also a receiver in the Fox box and you bring up the Fox box by uh, getting on and trans, you know, using a PL so that the box will recognize you and transmitting a DTMF tune and it brings up the box and the box transmits for some number of seconds. So uh, these transmit these unattended hunts became very, very popular, particularly in the Connecticut area. And you'll see this map of Connecticut that I put together of various places that fox boxes were placed just in the first six months of last year because it was so popular and people were enjoying finding them so much. So that became another way to do hidden transmitter hunting mobile during COVID. So I'm hoping that maybe that that in, in, uh, interested you in doing a little bit of hunting uh, mobile. But now let's talk a little bit about what happens because sometimes, as I said, you get, you don't just go directly to the hidden transmitter even when you're mobile. What if you get close, but uh, you don't see the transmitter, and so you have to get out and do some hunting on foot. And you need to shoot a bearing. Now this is, I don't know, this is from, uh, from some years ago. This hunter, uh, he's Yagi to a gun stock, so he could uh, carry it around that way and find transmitters after he had to get out of the car. I, uh, I only saw that once. He never did it again, so there may have been a reason why he didn't do it again. Sometimes uh, the hunter will, hunter will get all of his equipment out, his portable radio, his big antenna, and go hunting that way. Uh, that's a little bit cumbersome. And this is even more cumbersome. This fellow uh, enjoyed hunting, but he's, he has an antenna for two meters, and then he has antennas for the third and fifth harmonic, those uh, helixes. Well, actually, they're not helixes. They're circular uh, element yagis. 
And uh, again, that's if you want to tote all that through the woods, that's fine. But there's a lot of other more simple ways that I'll talk to in a minute. Anyway, on foot hunts have gone on for years and years. And, and I even talked about the one at the Ventura uh, ARL convention. But uh, certainly uh, a lot of ham fests, they'll put, you know, in a park, they'll put out transmitters people can find. It's a wonderful activity for scouts. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then there is, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, international style transmitter hunts and, uh, and a wonderful opportunity there. And that is, it, it goes by two names, radio orienteering and ARDF, which just stands for amateur radio direction finding. So you may often see that term in an international sense. It's done in big parks. Uh, it's nice because it is both a physical exercise and it's also a mental exercise, as you will see when you talk about it. And in these really big parks, you'll need a map and compass, and I'll talk about that. And the orienteering skill is about as important as your direction finding skills. And uh, you don't have to have a driver's license, and uh, you can work by yourself or in a team, uh, and I'll talk about that. The, um, but it's an activity for young people. It's an activity for old people, as you can see. It. <laughs> and it is an activity for even people in wheelchairs or people with disabilities can do it. Let's take those people away and look at a typical map. This is a map of um, one of the first transmitter hunts up in uh, the, the, the uh, Portland area. And in the, this big circle in the lower left, by the sea of contour there, the sea of the word contour, uh, you'll see a triangle down here by the, by the little inlet. That is the start point as marked on the map. Above it, over here in the uh, upper left, is this double circle, which is the end point. Yes, the start and the end are not always in the same place. And out here, and they're marked on this map, but of course the map you get when you do this is not gonna be marked, but there are five transmitters out here. So you start here, you go out and you try to find the transmitters in order, uh, well, not in order. You have to find as many as you can. Uh, you don't have to find them in any particular order and then get to the finish point. So again, it's a map skill, but it's also a direction finding skill. So it's a kind of a, some people call it a thinking man sport. The rules, I saw an email the other day, somebody was saying, look at these rules the ARRL has for, for transmitter hunts. Well, he didn't, and it was a copy of the international IARU rules, not ARRL's rules. Although here in Region 2, we pretty much follow the same rules that the Europeans came up with because we want to be able to send people to their events. So there's five transmitters in sequence. They send uh, NCW, MOE, MOI, MOS, MOH, MO5. If you know CW, you know that's one dit, two dits, three dits, four dits, and five dits. So you don't need to know CW in order to figure out which transmitter's on the air. You just count the dits. Uh, in the big areas where you might get lost, there's a separate transmitter on another frequency at the end that's sending just MO in CW over and over. Uh, the idea is not to hide these transmitters so they're invisible completely, because if you have 300 people, as you might in a world championships out in the woods, uh, you don't want them all digging in the dirt one after the other. So what they do is you, you're basically finding a flag, like you see in the lower right here, uh, that uh, plainly marks the location. But in the woods, you don't see that, you know, once you're 30 feet away, you don't see that flag. So it's not like it's a giveaway or anything like that. So the idea is find the flag, there's a punch there, you punch in and take off so that you can have dozens of people coming up in a very short period of time and, and, and checking in and moving on without having to dig in the dirt. A typical course from start to each transmitter to the finish might be five to 12 kilometers in a championship event. Certainly in a local park, you're not gonna make it that hard, especially if you've got kids. But uh, those, are, those are the international rules that everybody has agreed to that are used for championship events. It is done on two meters. It started on 80 meters with CW transmitters and it's still done on 80 meters. 
and uh, and of course it's done on two meters in the uh, in, in Europe they use AM signals because that's what they started out with uh, here in the Western Hemisphere we often use FM uh, we just tell everybody what to expect in the IARU championships clearly you want to be the first one to find the most transmitters so the rankings are by the number of transmitters you find uh, five four three two one depending on how many you're supposed to find by the way and uh, and then by time uh, there is usually a time limit if you're one minute late you're going to be disqualified in a in a championship event that's the way they do the rules and of course the young folks aren't competing against the old folks they started off with one category for everybody back in the years and years and years ago and then they realized that maybe the ladies should have a separate category and then maybe people over 40 should have a separate category nowadays there's all these categories all the way from um, m13 and m16 in youth championships to m70 uh, for people over 70 and yes there are plenty of people over 70 that do go out on these uh, on these championships so how do you what what kind of equipment would you use for something like that uh, the most people start off with a very simple yagi made a, and and uh, the most popular one that people build nowadays is uh, something that was first published by this gentleman in the lower left uh, his name is Joe Legio wb2 h o l and here he is showing his antenna at the Dayton ham fanchion uh, which, as I said, he has published, and a number of people have come up with kits for it. This is oftentimes a club project where someone in the club will put together a bunch of kits, and uh, everybody gets together on a Saturday and builds them. When we have our practice events in Southern California, usually there are kits available, and people will build them, and then they'll go out and find some transmitters. So uh, uh, clearly, this could be built for other frequencies, and uh, but it's it's uh, it's it's most popular on two meters. The resistive attenuators don't work well on two meters because what happens? Signal goes right into the case of the radio, bypasses the, uh, the uh, if you're using an HT, and most people start off with using an HT uh, or some sort of a, of, of a receiver, scanner, that sort of thing. And uh, that doesn't work well. So what is most popular is what's called the offset attenuator which basically consists of an oscillator, maybe four megahertz, maybe two megahertz, and a, and a diode for a mixer. And you control the amount of LO injection to that diode mixer. And uh, now you tune your radio to the offset frequency. Let's say if it's a two mega offset, and you're hunting 146.565, you tune to 148.565, and you can control the amount of signal there and you can get the equivalent of 100 dB of attenuation. So you can walk right up to a hit transmitter with a, an active attenuator like this. And again, that's a popular kit project, uh, and uh, boards for that are available. That is not, generally speaking, what the champions use. They use something a little bit more sophisticated. For example, here is a set that is made by uh, a ham in Australia. And it has, uh, it's complete, it's synthesized, it's got multiple frequencies, it's got built-in attenuator, and, uh, and, it, it, and I won't go into the details of it, but uh, uh, that's the sort of thing that is a lot easier to use. It's a lot more automatic in terms of attenuation, and it has an audible S meter, so as you're running through the woods, you hear the tone go wee-oo, wee-oo, depending on the signal strength. And it's a lot easier to do that than it is to use a, an actual meter. Uh, you may have seen this uh, new set from Ukraine uh, from Rig Experts. And they have it at DX Engineering, which is, uh, again, even more sophisticated. And again, if you're a serious competitor, you might want something like that. 80 meters is still a popular band. If you go to the, uh, and we usually try to have an 80 meter transmitter at each one of our local events. There's lots and lots of different sets, as you can see, that, uh, that you can use. And there's lots of information about 80 meter sets uh, at my website. Again, the rig expert people have just come out with a set that uh, they came out with a couple of years ago that you can get if you want to spend the bucks, but you can also build them. And there's lots of other ways. 
the ARDF courses are always a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes there are surprises. This picture was taken at the USA Championships a few years ago, where the finish was you had to kind of cross a low creek with very little water in it until it rained the night before. So now all of the hunters are trying to spice their way through this creek in order to get to the finish line. Uh, but the championships are wonderful because uh, any age can compete. Here's a, a future champion, surely, certainly. Um, the most recent, as I said, we now have, we started 2001, and every year, except last year because of COVID, USA holds a national championships. We haven't had it yet this year. It's going to be in October in uh, North Carolina, basically a similar area to this one. This was the last one before that, which was in uh, August of 2019 near in, in North Carolina. And you'll see all the hunters here. We had many, many states represented. There were visitors from foreign countries and we had everybody from teens to the mid seventies. Usually these events include training days, and, uh, and then of course the classic runs. There are medals for the winner in each of the divisions. And if you're really good and you win a medal, chances are pretty good you may be offered an opportunity to go to the world championships to represent the USA. World championships normally used to take place even numbered years. Now they're, uh, that's getting changed because of COVID, but the last one was, uh, was to be in 2020. It did not occur. It's going to be actually not this year either. It's going to be in 2022. But um, the U any every country can send a maximum of three persons in a an age or gender division to the World Championships. And uh, again, our championships the, are the way to select those. Every year, or as I said, we started going in 1998. Uh, unfortunately, the Europeans are still dominating because they've been doing it longest. Uh, in a, countries like Ukraine, for example, they have a dedicated team that tra trains together basically every month of the year. In these small countries, they can do that. In USA, it's a little tough. We're a big country. We can't exactly get together to do that. But in a small country like Ukraine, they can do that. They even have a team doctor, Igor Lazarev which you, you may have heard of in other contexts uh, from Ukraine. Well, our, our last team in 2018, we had eight OMs and three YLs, and they ranged in age from 33 to 76. We've had younger ones. We've had youngsters go before, um, and they did win medals. USA started winning medals in 2006, and every world championship since then, USA has won at least one medal, and now we're earning more. So I, I mentioned this, this may not, you know, some of us are uh, shack potatoes and uh, we're not likely to get out there and start running through the woods. But you all have kids or grandkids, hopefully. Uh, and this is a great way to let them experience ham radio, get a little exercise and maybe, you know, win a medal. So I would encourage you to let, encourage them or you to help them to experience it. Uh, we have sessions here in Southern California. Well, we used to have them about every month. COVID has changed that. Uh, we we have had once well one so far this year. We're going to have more. Uh, we were going to do something up in the mountains, and then they closed the national forests, so uh, that that got scotched. But uh, we we will we do try to have them. Well, we should have at least one more this year. And they're just basically informal. As I said, we have opportunities to build antennas and then we put transmitters out and people get to find them. Again, a great activity for scouts. We have uh, tried to do this at Jamboree on the air every year, one place or another. We have been doing this, not last year, of course, because of COVID, but uh, a, great, uh, a great opportunity to let kids experience it. So, that's, that's the two kinds of hit transmitter hunts. As I said, there is a public service aspect to this um, in numerous ways. Uh, hidden transmitter hunters, we used to be the only way you could track down those uh, high altitude balloons that they were launching. Nowadays, most of them have GPS on board, but it doesn't always work. And I've 
been on situations where we had to hunt down a balloon payload because the GPS stopped working and it ended up up in the mountains and we had to try to go find it. Uh, there are wildlife researchers who uh, could use help from uh, people experienced in direction finding. Uh, over here on the upper right, of course, is uh, Kathy Lavoni, who is uh, testing equipment for tracking aircraft ELTs. And I will tell you that two of the most active transmitter hunters in Southern California are very active with the CAP. And if an aircraft ELT goes off in Southern California, in that area, they're going to be called out to find it. And they'll tell you that their experience in going on ham transmitter hunts has helped them become very adept at finding these ELTs. In the lower right, uh, here is another opportunity. Uh, this isn't everywhere. It's certainly not in Orange County, but it is, for example, in San Luis Obispo County. And uh, that's called Project Lifesaver. You may have heard of it. It's a small little devices that, like this one that I'm circling here, that are worn on the wrist of Alzheimer's patients and other people who might wander. And uh, every once in a while, a, an Alzheimer's patient will wander off from a facility or something like that, and this is a way of tracking them down. These, also, these transmitters are in a, on about 200 megahertz. They're below the 220 band. And so a small, uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is a quad actually, that uh, is being used here uh, to find them. And the, and the fellow that does this, uh, <laughs> he and his wife do it. They've actually taken that antenna up into the sheriff's helicopter to uh, find an Alzheimer patient and he tells the story about this fellow that he was, he, uh, everybody thinks they're not gonna get very far, but this Alzheimer patient got on a bicycle and was uh, found headed down Highway 101. So they can get a long ways away. And uh, this is a, uh, a wonderful opportunity for public service uh, with Project Lifesaver. So I've, uh, I think I've just about timed it out and I wanna thank you all, I, I certainly, uh, uh, we'll answer questions, but before I do that, I will mention I do have a website, homingin.com, all, all run together as one word, and it's got a lot of information about local hunts and uh, other places where they're having hunts, where I know of people, where, they, uh, where you can contact them and uh, try to keep that updated, uh, and, and uh, uh, a lot of other information about things that I didn't have a time to talk about a lot today. So with that, uh, I'll thank you very much. Uh, you've been very quiet. And I think that's on purpose. So now I think uh, uh, Dan gets a chance to moderate uh, questions. Is that how you do it, or do I look in the in the in the chat, or what? Well, we have people that read the chat for you if you like. Uh, that's not a problem. And of course, we ask people to raise their hand if they got a question. So we'll go both angles. Um, I've take take me out so that the speaker speaking should be highlighted on your screen now, or at least have the opportunity to. Mary, do you see anything in chat? Only one question. Go ahead. It was, it, it, it's a question slash comment. Uh, are the AN slash PRG dash tens, which is used by the military, available mm -hmm. to purchase these days? Okay, I'm looking at that. Uh, I see. I see that question in the chat. Uh, you'll have to remind me what a PRD ten is. That uh, I know some of the surplus loops uh, that you know the army surplus loops that were used in the Korean War. Uh, there are versions that work on the approximately six meter band, and some of the hunters on the six meter hunts have used those. There are versions, I guess, for. 10 meters and lower also. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, Steve, KB9, VUJ, you want to unmute and ask you a question? If, you, if you're still on, Steve, so, but KB9, what's your uniform? Juliet, you want to come on and ask your, ask your question, please? I'm not seeing him. I'm seeing Barry. I'm seeing Barry Porter highlighted. I'm not yeah, sure why. I'm the one that's helping out with the moderating the questions. Yeah. Oh, the okay. Only thing Steve is is uh, he's muted there. His KB9 uh, VU uh, VUJ was it? Yeah. Okay. He, he's showing on, but he's he's got his video blocked and his he's muted, so he may have walked away from his station for a little bit. 
Okay. That's everything that's in the chat. Okay, I don't see your hands yet. You did a good job. So all of the questions were answered. Yeah, you did a great I was going to say, either, that, either I told you everything you needed to know or else everybody went to sleep or uh, or, or they just, they just you know, I don't know. But that's great. I love answering questions, though, if anybody has any, particularly yeah, about couple, getting started in your own up. area. Okay. okay. Dennis, why don't you take it away? Yeah, Dennis, take it away. Well, just a real quick. Uh oh. Do we there have you are. We're unmuted. Okay, we got it. Um, Joe, some years ago at uh, Maker Fair down in San Diego, we actually did a T hunt on 10 gigahertz. Yes, Kerry and, uh, and uh, the other. That was, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Kerry uh, Banky and the group down the San Diego Microwave Group. What a great event that was. That was a lot of fun. The only problem was it was indoors. And uh, that was a problem because <laughs> it bounces off of everything. Oh, it, it certainly does. Yes, I met Kerry um, uh, one at a, at a, one at one of the ham places that I gave a talk. I'm trying to remember where it was. It might have been South Orange County. Anyway, he showed me the gear. I took some pictures. I actually wrote it up, and it was in my CQ column. Uh, oh, cool. Okay. So, uh, so yes, that was a that was a great idea. I I still have my trusty uh, tape measure and the offset attenuator, and it uh, gets well, used. It gets used periodically out here trying to track down interference. <laughs> I try to come out on one of our hunts sometime. I was talking to Lisa about that. We may just do that sometime. Joe, I want to say while well, I get a chance here, thank you for uh, coming and joining us. It was great to see you, and I uh, hope we get a ch chance to chat before you leave tonight. But uh, Great to see you, sir. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you were there. Okay. I knew I'd have I knew I'd have one enthusiastic follower. That's good. <laughs> I think you got a lot of them. Okay, Oscar over in Puerto Rico. Take it away. Uh, Joe, kudos on all the work that you have done in training and probably a lot of development on these things. We also have uh, similar activities in Puerto Rico, and we use this type of transmitter. There you go. And it, how enthusiastic we are, you can s keep seeing how many transmitters <laughs> I do have. <laughs> those so, are bionics. Those, those are, are bionics. By, and, those are made and, by and, Bion, and, uh, and they're great little transmitters. He has different I, versions. He has one that uh, is synthesized. Is that the synthesized one? Yeah, that is correct. I, I have the previous one with the modules, uh, and I used to buy the Uh, Fox something, mm -hmm. but now that he has the, uh, the the single unit, normally I buy 10 watts and I go back to half a watt for the long long term uh, battery. But uh, one of the things that we do, and and you know, to be fair in the whole hunting, and it's because it's a lot of training and enthusiasm, and you have to bring people. But when people get really professional about it, you have to take it out offline. How you take it offline? when you have very good people that are, they're, they're capable of finding things easily, you, you give them the bragging rights. And what we mean with that is that they have the, uh, they became the people who hide the next events. Mm -hmm. and, and those, they already have the bragging rights because they're going to hide the, uh, the transmitter themselves, whatever technology they want to use. And they are very proud not to be part of the hunting. So the other ones can learn. So that way you rotate people. Uh, in not only only one person that they, I mean, or a team that they are experts. So that way, they, we rotate them and make them more active and, and so on. So just give you ideas, and we can talk about crazy things done. I mean, I mean, not for killing anybody, being safe at the same time, but really have a lot of fun. A lot of groups do it a different way. I know having the uh, the the person that wins hide the next hunt is pretty standard, although there are places where, you know, one guy seems to win a lot of the hunt, so he'd be hiding all the time, and they don't necessarily want to do that. So some of the clubs do other things. For example, uh, uh, Orange County Racies, when they were doing hunts, they haven't resumed them after COVID. Uh, they would get non-hunters in the group to be the hiders because it was a racies group. So they'd say, here, you know, you can be part of this test, even if you don't hunt, uh, you can be the hider. Uh, down in San Diego, they basically create a list months ahead uh, and, and, tr and rotate it around so that everybody gets a chance to, to hide. So it's really, there's really multiple ways you can do it. And that's the nice thing about it. There's, with mobile hunts, uh, there's rules. I mean, usually rules. 
Uh, but the, high, the groups get to set their own rules. They're not stuck with some international set of rules. So if they like to do uh, what, whatever the group likes to do, they can do. Again, thank you very much for your presentation. Really interesting. Well, yeah. I'm glad. It sounds to me like you've got a lot of experience. I'm glad you've, uh, uh, you're having fun with it. I hope it gave you a few new ideas. You did. You did. And uh, we should share some of them, uh, also including uh, fingerprint. Uh, Oh, receiver. fingerprinting. Oh, heavens, yes. fingerprinting. We haven't done fingerprinting for a very, very long time, but, but it is a good technology. Again, there's so many different things uh, that, that uh, are things like that that we could talk about. And that's why I've, uh, and maybe I should do this again. I, I've been uh, writing a column. I started in 73 Magazine back in about 88, and now it's in CQ Magazine four times a year. And I try to cover things like that, which are unusual little aspects of it. And so I'd and, and but I also like to hear from groups that are doing things and are doing things differently. And I love hunt re reports and results. So send them to me. I'd love to use them, and you might find them in CQ magazine. Uh, the reason is that you can have a lot of transmitter like Eddie Peter, and you're doing the fox hunting for this uh, guy who is actually interfering. So fingerprinting it will allow you to fingerprint that person on that repeater and, and mm -hmm. you start excluding the other ones, including That's if right. you have multiple transmitter for for hunting itself. But at the same time, when this guy comes up with the new modern figure sprinting, you can search it and you will get a, a flag that, hey, this is the same transmitter and he's identifying himself. So, you know, that That's is really, right. uh, uh, that's really interesting story, but there's a lot of le learning curve here and you can do a lot of things. There from was ballooning, a From ballooning, actually uh, help or your cars and things like that. It's unbelievable all the, all the new technology you can learn. But again, thank you, Joe. Thank you. There was a company called Motron that came out with the first fingerprinting equipment quite a few years ago. And it was a card that plugged into a, like a 286 uh, computer. Well, that, that's, that's old technology. But people figured out that you could do the same thing with a sound card. And now most, I think most of the people that are doing transmitter fingerprinting are doing it with a, some sort of sound card technology or something like that. And uh, it isn't all that difficult to do uh, once you figure out how to hook it to the receiver. You're absolutely right. That one, you were able to fingerprint the discriminator and also the noise of the receiver. So mm -hmm. they were both uh, signal include, in, involved into it. So anyway. did, you have, did you have a successful find that way? Good. Yeah. And, and, and it was so amazing, the people that you find that they were actually being the bad guys. Uh, it's yes. very disappointing. That's a whole other topic. Come on, Jim. <laughs> That's a whole other talk. Something? Let's, let's pick up Dave here. We've got some questions in the text. Also. Dave, uh, from Idaho, you want to take it away? Yeah, we haven't had very many uh, fox hunts around here, but we just purchased <laughs> one for the club. Okay. And uh, we we're wondering, we've heard that people can use paper towel holders wrapped in, you know, paper, the centerpiece on a paper towel wrapped in tin foil used for attenuators for locating the signal. And I haven't seen anything on it. Yeah, that's that. I'm not sure a paper towel holder is, you know, small enough to, or that's so small. Uh, most of the people I've seen will use a tube that's maybe. Well, it's big enough so that the entire radio can be lowered into the tube because uh, like an HT or something like that. Uh, and what that basically is uh, for Dennis and people like this that have played with microwaves all these years is it's, called, it's a waveguide below cutoff. Is if, if you have, you're basically putting the radio into a wave, what amounts to a waveguide, a, paper, a tube covered with, with foil or something like that to the depth that it attenuates the signal enough that you can that you can get a bearing with it. And usually you combine that with something I didn't talk about, which is the body fade method, where you, uh, uh, you get a bearing with an HT. And you can do this, well, if the signal isn't too terribly strong, and again, you can attenuate it with this tube method, but you hold the radio up against your chest and then do a pirouette and turn, and where you hear the weakest signal, your body is attenuating the signal, and it's called the body fade. So uh, basically, if you want to, you can walk backwards all the way to the transmitter by following this null. Uh, and I, we always have a saying 
Uh, the bigger the body, the better the bearing. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. You bet. I'm seeing some things in the, in the chat. Go to that. In the chat, there's a, there's a uh, posting of a website that explains the, what the AN slash PRD10 is. So if anyone's oh. listening, Dan will post the chats with the uh, recording of this session, and you'll be able to follow it there instead of me reading it out. Okay, I'll, I'll look at it. That sounds interesting. As I said, I, mm -hmm. well, okay, okay, but the person that asked that question apparently is not with us anymore because I wanted to find out if right. that was a poop or something else. Did you, did you look at it? Do you know uh, what it, no, can, can you describe it? Okay, then I probably can't uh, help any more than, than that. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something Dad, are you here. you on right now? NJJED, -E you want to come on and uh, talk about the ANPRD10? Okay, not. there you go. Um, all right, and I'm seeing something about geocaching, and uh, uh, I think that's uh, might the geocaching community might be a good source for future hams too, but uh, certainly people that would be interested in transmitter hunting. So I agree with that. Uh, that was from John. Thank you. And Lloyd. Body fate, okay, well, <laughs> okay. I'm thinking of, uh, well, no, I, I won't tell that story, but okay. Collection of jamming platoon leader in the 90s, okay. Okay, B9 VUJ is here. Right now. Is Steve with Not us? Uh, you were asking about the. Uh, and 6 jed but is KB9BUJ here? Because I think he was also used at ANPRD10. I guess not. All right. Well, I'm open to other questions. If uh, anybody else, I just want everybody to uh, uh, introduce that your club to this and say, you know, there, I am very pleased that I'm going to be I'm writing the next column. And one of the things I'm finding is there's a couple of new groups and one in the Pacific Northwest and the other one, I'm trying to remember exactly where it is, who are just now getting going in this and they some real enthusiasm in their clubs uh, for this. They've had their first, you know, antenna builds and they're they're out there finding transmitters and they're loving it. Dan, you're muted. Who's muted? I am muted. Dan, I am sorry you. about that. Larry <laughs> in California, you, you keep raising the clap hat. Is that intentional or are you trying to raise your hand and ask, ask a question? Actually, a little bit of both. You know, too. A little bit of both. Because uh, years ago, uh, there was a state park that we went to. And, uh, do you still guys do the build, do the early morning build, and then do a hunt afterwards? Because that's what I was involved in, and me and a bunch of engineers from Edwards came down, and we, uh, matter of fact, I think it took us five hours to find all the, <laughs> find all the transmitters in that park. It was hilarious because it was, um, you, you posted it on a homing in. That was quite a while ago. But do you still yeah. do the uh, construction before the... Uh, we try to. The, the the fellow that basically handles the construction projects is Marvin Johnston, KE6HTS. He's from Santa Barbara. He uh, makes and sells kits for the antenna, and he also makes has a board for the attenuator. And what usually people build is the attenuator built into uh, into a small plastic electrical box that's right in the middle of the boom of the uh, uh, measuring tape antenna. And that is the most popular thing that gets built at these sessions. Yeah, that's, uh, and, that's what I got. And it, okay. was really, it was really great because that was a good setup for us to get started. And uh, it was really hilarious us running around trying to find all that. <laughs> I said it took us five hours. <laughs> we have uh, usually two different, well, we have the 80 meters too, but we have, I usually put out three to five really fairly easy transmitters that are right, say, within... 200 feet of uh, where we do the get together and everybody can kind of practice 
making sure their antenna works, learning how to use their antenna, their antenna meter, I should say, and that sort of thing. And then we'll usually have a uh, five transmitter ARDF style hunt, not a full course, which would be 12 kilometers or something like that, but, but smaller. It could have been Benelli Park that we, we like to do it there. I'm not sure which park you came to. But uh, it's been quite a while. We, uh, I think our next one, go ahead. It, the only reason why we didn't ever part, go back and participate was because uh, the project we were on uh, started uh, a ton of overtime. But it was so much fun. I got, I got to tell you, we, I mean, you guys helped us out a lot, and you made it so much fun. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you had fun. And uh, come back, for heaven's sakes, now that you've got the equipment. Uh, then come on back. <laughs> uh, it, homing in, I do have, well, of course, uh, do have a mailing list and a, and a groups.io that you can get on to get announcements of our Southern California hunts. Uh, but I also announce them, of course, in homingin.com. So if you want to know when the next one is, we're, as I said, we were going to do on Pinos, but Forrest got and then, then all the fires. So the next one will probably be next month and we'll probably go to uh, Benelli Regional Park. Yeah, that's down in, uh, that's pretty far south. Yes, okay. It's uh, by Laverne, it's by Raging Walkers. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, it, it, I mean, uh, you get a good camaraderie there too. So, yeah. A lot of the people come keep coming back and we like that. Bob, a KF4 IMX, you had a hand up. Do you still want to ask a question? Yeah, I just have a comment. Uh, uh, we built our, uh, our club built their antennas back in July. We did a hunt in uh, August and it was so it's, uh, good. We're doing another one in October and we're here in Orlando. What club is that? Um, it's Lamar's, uh, Lake Monroe Amateur Radio Society. Do you write up your hunts on your, in your club newsletter? Uh, no, I don't believe they did. Other, who is than, the, uh, other than the minute from the meeting. Who is the uh, usual hunt master that kind of is the organizer? Is that you? Uh, no, it's uh, Jim Robart. Jim Robart. Do you have his call? No, I sure don't. If you go on the website, uh, he'll be okay. here. Because I'd like to know more about that. I'd like to get in touch. So uh, uh, thank you for letting me know that. And that's okay, another that's suggestion is, is, you know, put something in your club website, put something in your club newsletter uh, to, to help raise interest. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll let, if I could, I'd like to ask, uh, Joe, if when we're done here, if you will email me your presentation, uh, I will get it posted so everybody can enjoy that and we'll put it with the video. Okay, so it goes to you. I, I yes, can do that. Me. Yes. As, as you notice, the slides are not read them slides. They're, so somebody just looking at the presentation is going to see a lot of pretty pictures, but they, they aren't going to get the words. Well, they're going to be watching the movie. They're going to be watching they, the video. So they can watch it on YouTube, right? Exactly, exactly. And uh, oh, I also want to comment. There's lots of people here who want to share their experiences and talk to you. After we close this meeting out, if you'll just come right back in just like you came in the first time, uh, you could have those chats. I have a set, though. I don't have to be there as a host. You just come right back in and meet like you do after any club meeting and uh, uh, talk and, and do your thing. Are there any more questions out there? I'm just testing their microphone, but... Uh, okay, I don't... Uh, and nothing else? Do you see anything, Barry? Nope, looks good to me. But Joe, I really again want to tell you how much we appreciate this. It's been a great presentation. You got a lot of feedback. This is when we have fun like this, this is what it's all about. So I really appreciate you doing this. I'll close Great audience. Out. And then uh, uh, I'll, as soon as I get closed out, those that want to come back in and just write you using this uh, session, just go for it. Have fun. 73s, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.